be with you. And also with you. Good morning to everyone. Uh, you can tell by the fact that I'm upright and not like this or like this. Uh, that that Scott's back manning the Milo, and we're very thankful for that, Scott. Um, we uh, people have been asking about in-person worship. Our numbers in Tennessee are, are better, and in Murray County they're better. So we hope to be back like mid-February sometime. So we will keep you apprised of that. Uh, the Wednesday night uh, videos, the Facebook will start on February third. So I hope you look for that. You may know of any announcements. Let's worship God. Unite in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from the book of Jonah. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This is after um, Jonah has had his experience with uh, sushi and, and he has gone to do what God sent him to do in the first place. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to none of that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk. He cried out 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they changed from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Amen. Um, we want to remember those in our prayer list, and, and I know we've added Tim Jones to the prayer list this week. Um, does anybody here know of any others? Um, we want to remember our first uh, responders and service members, Jacob Roth, Isaac Dorney, Chris Tucker, Jesse Owens, Daniel Westmoreland, Jason Cruz, Jerry Lovell, Jeff Lovell, Nick McCoyne, Matt McCoyne, Blaine Click, Tommy Henley, Bradford Norton, Michaela Pierpoint, and Matthew Hill. And our healthcare workers, Cassandra Waters, Jessica Woody, Kendall Hill Ibarra, Sarah Fitzgerald, Shelley Woody, Kimberly Height Nace, Jennifer Leland, Laura Ballard, Jessica Bitwork, Lisa Donaldson, and Mary Snead. Let's bow our heads. You are a great God, O oh Lord, 
and we follow you on the paths that you've set before us, knowing that your loving grace is with us each day. And we pray, O oh Lord, for your deliverance from this time of pandemic and that healing would come and that the deaths would go down that the world might be healthier. We pray, O oh Lord, for our world that is so filled with violence and hate that that may dissipate as well. And that we as Christians might be instruments of your loving grace to rid the world of this hatred. Bless the work of the church, O oh Lord. The ministries and missions that are set before us are, can be accomplished only with your grace upon us. And we thank you for that. We pray that you forgive us of our sins and give us grace and love to forgive others. We pray for peace in our world. We pray for those on our prayer list. And we remember our urgent needs and we remember, O oh Lord, the, the health care workers, the first responders, and the, and the overwhelming work that they have to do during this time. Bless them and keep them well and strong and safe. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who came and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Our first hymn this morning is number 360 and 96, for oh, Jesus I have promised, first and last verses. <laughs> gospel reading this morning is the gospel of Mark chapter 1 verses 14 through 20. Now after John was arrested Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the sea of Galilee he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. 
as he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Amen. Let us pray. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. This call to preaching to discipleship story has caused some reflection on my part this last week as I look towards retirement in a few months, but not an end of ministry, I hope. And as my thoughts went back to my saying yes to God, I realized that it will be 50 years ago this April uh, that I went to the chancel rail at Blakemore United Methodist Church on the left end where it kind of bends around on a good on a Holy Week service I think it was Good Friday night and I said yes to God I will go into the ministry but Lord I don't want to preach I'll do some other form of ministry for it was in that same sanctuary about 18 months earlier I was making an announcement for the youth and I was on that side of the lectern and when I got through instead of two steps down there were like six or seven steps and as I got right in the middle headed back to my seat the preacher said did y'all understand him and people said no and so that kind of uh, scarred me and I thought there's no way I could be a preacher uh, I'll just have to do some other form of ministry and you can see how well that turned out at that time after John the Baptist had been arrested Jesus came to Galilee he'd been in, in Judah in Judea uh, and he came to Galilee preaching in his preaching, there was a call to discipleship, a call to a movement that would change the world. God stepped into human history. Mark has three views of Jesus. They are of Jesus as preacher and as exorcist and as teacher. And this is, of course, a picture of Jesus as preacher. This is the most popular call story of any of the Gospels. And in it, we're introduced to Simon, who is nicknamed Peter by Jesus. Uh, in the Bible, when you get a new status, it, it, you're often given a new name, as Abram became Abraham, as Saul became Paul. This new name for his new status, Peter, it meant rock. And later, he would say, on this rock, I will build my church. And he called his brother, Andrew. And then he called the Zebedee's boys, James and John, who were in a, note near, a boat nearby. These were middle-class businessmen with houses and careers, families and employees. The call to ministry could be a costly call. Uh, these men left these businesses and families uh, to go and follow Jesus. And some still answer that call a little later in life. They've got established careers and families and the Lord's been calling them and finally at 35 or 40, they answer that call and they leave their careers, go to seminary, incur that cost, speech at, preach at small churches um, until they're ordained five, six, seven years later. What can this story tell us about our call to discipleship? Jesus came preaching and we want to make, we might want to scoot part past that, that powerful statement. Jesus came preaching. Oh, it was different then. It was in person. There were no empty front row seats. They, in fact, they got so close to him that in one of the gospel, he gets into the Peter's boat says back up a little bit so I can see more of the people that's preaching them. There were no microphones, no speakers. It was just his voice. We don't we do it somewhat differently today, but we still have this method of message. Uh, in person, the verbal communication is still the most effective form of communication. 
almost all who heard Amanda Gorman at the inauguration this week can attest to that. There was always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it, she said in the hill we climb. Uh, by the way, I saw this morning that on Amazon, her two new books are number one and number two on their sales list. But we were moved by her command of words as she recited this poem. We have other media today, and preaching and teaching and poetry may seem frail, and yet they are still effective. Is preaching given is given impetus by the fulfillment of time? It says when the time was fulfilled, it doesn't mean it was a certain day or a certain time on the clock. It was when the Lord said the time is right. He came. And he said the kingdom is at hand. Time has moved from the anticipation that we had during Advent to a time of actualization. The kingdom is here. Sometimes I think we would like to stay in that anticipation mode. That's the, the mode where we know and are comfortable in. For there we can complain and we can long for God and we can uh, say he hasn't come yet and when will he come and that be our focus. But when the kingdom is at hand, when it's near, when it's upon us, as Jesus preached, we're a little bit more uncomfortable with that because that means we've got to get away from our complaining and groaning. We've got to do something because that kingdom is here and the power is upon us. We don't quite know what to do with it. Kind of like we don't quite know what to do with the resurrection of Jesus. We can talk about the cross a lot, but when the resurrection of Jesus comes, it leaves us a little bit baffled. Jesus said, believe in the gospel. The gospel, what is this exactly? What is this gospel? It's good news. It's both the subject of Jesus teaching and preaching in parables, wise sayings, words of grace and mercy and love. It's teaching about life and how to live in God's world with his loving grace. His message is mysterious at times. A lot of times we just don't try it. G.K. Chesterton, and I've quoted this before, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And sadly, sometimes the church leaves it untried and forgotten. The best way to be the church, by the way, is to be the church. And Jesus says, love your enemies. Forgive others as you are forgiven. We have a hard time with that one. Go the second mile. When somebody asks for your shirt, give him your coat as well. Difficult words. But words that point to the kingdom of God and what it means when that kingdom is upon us. And we're called to be a part of this gospel. But his gospel is also lived out in who Jesus is. A friendly man, a popular man who went to parties with good food and wine, a man seen at prayer at all hours of the day and night, a man who taught and left the audience astounded and amazed, one who healed and touched and loved and humbled himself, even going to a cross. He is God on earth who suffered at the hands of of man, a despicable and cruel death, but was raised from this death to give us new life. Jesus came preaching through his words of life about the kingdom of God and who he was. Lamar Williamson has done a commentary in the interpretation series, and he noted in his writings that the introduction to this to this commentary is 25 pages long. And he noted that Mark does the same thing in two verses. He introduces the whole gospel in these two verses. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What powerful words. Now Jesus' first words 
direct words that we hear of were the words of Jesus in our passage that are coming up. He came up to Simon and Andrew in their boats. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I know that's a little sexist in the language, but I love the poetry of it. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. Follow me. That's the essence of discipleship. Rabbis and teachers taught as they walked. And if you wanted to follow a particular rabbi or teacher or philosopher, you did so as you walked along with him. You might literally follow. And he says, follow me. There was that, that personal connection to Jesus. The gospel is about him and the kingdom he brought. We cannot stress too much how these were common folks who worked hard and who responded to this. Two things to note about this call. Follow me. I think in my preaching over the years, as I think about it, I've done a disservice to this text. I've kind of tried to explain it away. I've said that, you know, Jesus has been around maybe a few weeks and they may have heard him at some event or heard him a few times and maybe the gospel's starting to work in him. And that may be so. But that kind of explains the way the dynamism of Jesus being and the force of his personality. The charisma that he had that made folks realize that he was good news that made everything else pale in comparison. There was that spiritual force about him. And so I've maybe been wrong in saying that. Maybe it was just clearly as it showed that he came and he said, you follow me and I will make you fish for people. And there was something in that commanding and yet gentle voice that was an invitation to more in life than they knew. There was a reckless and restless impulse about his call. Reckless, some say that, that the people would be offended at the idea that James and John would leave their father, leave their family, and go into this following of Jesus. And the second thing is, I believe this follow me is in line with his call to repent. Repent is a word that we must not miss in the passage. It's not just being sorry for our sins. That's not the fullness of repentance. But it's a move to God, a decision or awareness of a need to walk Godward in our lives. Not all of us are called to preach, but all of us are called to follow Jesus Christ. All of us are called to discipleship. John Calvin said repentance involves two dimensions. It's changing our lives for the better, that is, turning away from our sin. But it's also a conversion and a newness of life. It's what we're going to and what fills us. And Jesus calls his hearers to turn around, to shift the direction of their lives, to look and to listen, and to give their full attention to the kingdom which is arriving. Then he meets us there. We don't have to go all the way by ourselves. As we turn, we are met by the Lord. And that's where the last part comes in. And I will make you. It's not our ability. It's our availability to the Lord that matters. Bishop Wilman said it's inevitable. He was Before he was bishop, he was dean of the chapel at Duke University. He taught and was the preacher there on campus. And, uh, of course, dealt with thousands of young people over the years. And he said it was inevitable God would get hold of somebody else and the first words that they spoke to Bishop Willowen were, I know this is going to sound crazy to you. I know this is going to sound crazy to you. One was a brilliant doctor who had graduated from the best schools, who could have had a great practice anywhere, making lots of money. But he went on a medical mission to Africa because that's what he knew God wanted him to do. God takes us where we are and who we are and he makes us more than we may dare to dream. Jesus said, come and follow me and I will make you. That's the fullness of the repentance is when we get to that point and let him mold us in the image of who he wants us to be as we grow in Christ, as Paul says. The last thing is, there's, a, there's an urgency about this call on everybody's part. There was this couple at one church 
and she was at church every Sunday, but he was not. He didn't. He didn't come to church. But he had to go to the hospital, and I went and visited with him and prayed with him and for him. And one day I got a phone call. One Sunday, preacher Andrew wants to be baptized, and I knew that she meant right now. This was not well. We'll set this up. And she meant to come over to the hospital right now and baptize him. He felt God's call. And he knew the urgency of his needed response. And so I baptized him in a bed at St. Thomas on a Sunday afternoon as I've baptized some here in Columbia. We need to recover that urgency in the modern church. If we want to be the church, we have to be the church. And a lot of churches are not ready to be the church. We need to be the church and let Christ create in us who he should be. We've a story to tell and we've a love to live and people need to hear it and see it right now. Amen. Our closing hymn for the morning is Rock of Ages, Clef for Me. First and last verses. Rock of hatred, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side. Christ and the love of God and fellowship and communion in the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore.